So we're talking about class, we're talking about the transformation of work, we're talking about um, a debate that's been going on now for about, say, for practical purposes, uh, today's purposes, going back to the late 60s. So you could take it back to Daniel Bell and the rise of post-industrial society. And, um, and you can trace it through to kind of key contributions from Andre Gortz uh, through to kind of people like uh, coming out of the Marxism Today tradition, uh, through to people like Manuel Castells, Anthony Giddens, Lord Giddens, um, Richard Sennett, all these sorts of people. And so I'm going to offer a couple of observations on that. Um, the first thing to say is that there's this inverse law of evidence operating in that the larger claims that are made by people, the smaller the evidence they offer for it to substantiate the positions. If you go back to people like Daniel Bell, Daniel Bell talks about the rise of post-industrial society, he talks about the significance of you know, uh, the, the rise of service, uh, industry, employment, certain occupational shift and so forth. Now, what, and he offers very, very good data for it. It's really interesting and it's a, you know, a model of its kind. He's also very, very modest in his judgments. He argued against people talking about the knowledge economy of the time uh, which was coming through. He says, look, let's draw, draw very limited inferences about that. At the same time, there's people like Alvin Toffler who say the changes we're witnessing now at this point in time are greater than anything, anything, since the start of the transition from hunter-gatherer society. It's a, it's a huge, huge you know, claim for, uh, for societal transformation. And the evidence he offers is things like uh, the, the um, plastic pens, dis disposable diapers, the growth of rentalism, you know, the sense of, kind of um, anecdotal evidence of change. And all along we have this idea of an kind of inverse balance between the, the huge claims we're making for transformation and evidence to support it. Now, you can take that all the way through to the contemporary times because there's more people in this debate who are like Alvin Toffler than they are like Daniel Bell. Evidence, evidence, evidence is lacking in those huge claims for societal change uh, and uh, some fundamental shift in the nature of, of, of work, of employment relations and so forth. So, so the first thing to say is that it's got a history and interestingly it's got a, a history that is significantly post-Marxist. In other words, we're talking about people who are describing the world of work and how it's changes and so forth. And we're not talking about the Charles Handys of this world, we're going to management gurus and fortunes, talking to businessmen about the changing nature of industry and technology and so forth. We're talking about people who are coming from left field. We're talking about you know, the Emmanuel Castellas of this world, Senates and so forth. These are the post-Marxists, or people who ended up kind of departing that, uh, that tradition. But still, if you like the word of Peter Marcuse, um, there's still signs of this ghostly Marxism in how they, uh, how they uh, address the questions of the transformation of working class and so forth. So there's a legacy there. It's coming from left field. It's not coming from the right. The people who are arguing about the end of class, the polarization within class, aren't coming from, kind of, uh, from, uh, from the conservative quarters. Um, so it also means that we are shifting, in terms of the, 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 kind of the discourse of sociologists, from the structural to the relational. We're not simply talking about transformational work which involves changes in occupations, changes in industry and so forth, changes in, 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 in skill competition and so forth. We're talking about relational shifts in the nature of employment, in the, in the relationship between capital and labor. That's the, I feel like the order of the, of the, of the uh, what's up for grabs, is an enormous transformation in the nature of society, the nature of class, a shift, many would suggest, in the balance of class forces, in the composition of class, which is described in terms of, um, uh, in many ways, of increasing polarization. Now, this shift towards seeing, kind of seeing changes in the nature of class and within and inter inter interclass differences has also been suffused by uh, dual labor market theory. Dual labor market theory, you probably know better under ideas of, you know, with flexible labour markets, we saw the growth of core and periphery groups, a group that is kind of a, used to be called the primary labour market, you know, where you had people with permanent secure jobs, long-term prospects, 
And we had a secondary group who were just sort of, you know, people who didn't enjoy that. Uh, and so it was later, later called a group that was described as, you know, numerically flexible, part-time casual, temporary, and so forth. Again, so those were functionally flexible. Polarization taking along those lines. Now, we need to stop for a, for a minute on dual labour market theory and ideas of polarisation within the class. There's something perverse about it. Perverse in terms of its method. Because it offers, well first of all, it's a method that says, I define this group, this periphery, in terms of what it isn't. This is not the non-standard working, this is not the standard working class, it's not the typical working class, it's atypical and non-standard. It's designed, designed in terms of what it isn't. That's like saying, I define people in this room in terms of they're not fascist. It doesn't really get me very far in defending all your politics except to see what you aren't. Now that's, a, that's in terms of method, a very poor way of going. Now, there's something else with this as well in terms of perverse generalization. If you, if you lump together a disparate group of part-time, temporary, casual and so forth, and you represent their experience based upon the worst, elements of that group, then you hugely exaggerate the bad conditions they have within this group. Similarly, with the, with, the, um, uh, with the primary group, the core group and so forth, if you take from the very, very best and you extend and represent the primary group, they're exaggerating. So the point, one point with this labour market dualism idea is it hugely exaggerates on both sides, how good life is for the primaries and how bad life is for the secondaries. The other thing to say, and do a quick, and I'm sure because you all come across the idea of core and periphery in your own minds, have a, a small exercise in your head. Imagine you're working at the workforce. Put in one group all those who work full time. Put also and add to them all those who are permanent. Who is left? What proportion of working class is there? My guess is about three or four percent. If you add, put in one group, the permanent and the full time. That's one group, and the rest are left out. The reason why you have such a large number in primary and in the, in the, in the full time and the permanent is that the status of this periphery is hugely expanded by inclusion of part time permanent workers. Now, how you understand that is enormously important. And if you generalize from the casualization at the fringes, to a whole swathe of the working class, you know, uh, going through up to up to forty percent, then you're hugely, hugely overstating the problems that you have. Now, the evidence does not support the, the you know, arguments for structural change in the working class, leading to impermanent employment, labour market disaffiliation, detachment, and so forth. It just isn't there. Any number of any number of statistics will tell you this, and I'll offer you one that you haven't heard yet because it's not had a public airing until this afternoon. <laughs> and that is, well, first of all, job stability hasn't declined. Long-term employment has increased across high turnover industries and low turnover industries among on, on private sector and public sector. That has happened in terms of the OECD countries, in terms of Australia, Canada, and so forth. That is a trend. Long-term employment has only declined in Europe, only declined in Europe in agriculture. <coughs> Temporary employment agencies, which are an enormous part of the argument about this impermanent workforce, account for 1% of the workforce in Europe and North America. 1%. And yet we have this huge intellectual edifice built around them. Now, Part-time employment has massively expanded job stability and long-term employment, especially for women. Part-time employment has you know, added to labour market retention and affiliation and attachment of the women to the labour market. So flexible labour market in its, most, in its most significant statistical sense has added to job stability. And finally, because I anticipate Guy's argument coming up because I've had a spat, you know, a friendly spat, uh, <laughs> uh, elsewhere. 
when he kind of had you know, the temerity to say my data was out of date. Um, <laughs> America, America, where employment protection is relatively weak, where unions are relatively weak compared to Europe. Between 1983 and 2010, and here we have it, you heard it first on Radio ISJ, <laughs> average job tenure has increased by 25%. 25% increase in average job tenure over that period, almost three decades. The argument for the growth of this transient, impermanent, casualised work workforce isn't there to substantiate the point. Now, well, therefore, what is job insecurity? Now, it is a complex thing, and what I'm saying in the first instance, it's not explained by the rate of redundancy, the prospect for redundancy, or, in fact, the growth of part-time employment, and the, all these signs of new employment patterns. There's a fantastic study done by kind of, uh, some researchers in Cambridge, because according to opinion poll evidence, 30% of the workforce describe you know, a high, you know, insecurity. There's a reasonable chance, they think or ex express, that within a year, their jobs might be gone. The study did a very good follow-up with these workers who said, who said, my job might not be here in a year's time. And they probed them and they said, do you really think your job's not gonna be here in a year's time? And the argument was, well, no. But we're worried about the consequence of that job going. It, so they were not talking about the, the, the likelihood of job loss, but the consequence of that. And the reasons for insecurity was more to do with the environment in which they worked, market conditions under which they worked, not to do with the content of their jobs, whether exposed to ICT or what have you. Yep. Job insecurity is also critically expressed, or the rise in insecurity is critically expressed by those who already are relatively secure. Because if you are already insecure, if you already have low insurance uh, employment prospects, you're not going to miss what you never had. So imagine, say, for instance, actors. Actors, by and large, some, some people might say, well, they are obviously insecure because they don't work, they're not just in life. But they know that. I just know that unless they're kind of Ken Barlow from Coronation Street, they're not going to be working in a soap for 40 years. They're going to be on very, very short-term engagements. That's what they expect. However, what happens is those who previously had a high expectation of employment prospects, and that is, when that is dashed, you see the rise in job insecurity. And that's why it happened very significantly in the 1990s. And ironically, ironically, it arose, this is the point made by Francis Green, it arose during periods of employment declines. It happened during the 1990s. So it's, 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 a very, it's, it's a complex thing, but certainly what it's not tied to, what it's not tied to is the sense that jobs are less substantial, they're less needed by employers, Otherwise, we couldn't explain the very significant shift in terms of long-term retention of labour. Now, I've got a couple of slides in terms of, because our concept is, is class today. Um, uh, it's about the, there we go. What does it all mean? I mean, one of the, one of the structural changes in the, in the working class has to do with the impact of crises. Don't leave, guy. <laughs> it's to do with the uh, impact of crisis. And first of all, with the recession of 1979-84, it is hugely significant in terms of its impact upon manufacturing and very, very importantly, large-scale manufacturing. So the total loss of jobs in manufacturing in this recession was 1.86 million. In establishing employing 1,000 to 1,500, 300, almost just over a third of a, a million were gone. In establishing establishments, big factories, big factories in manufacturing, employing more than 1,500 people, nine, almost a million, just over half of all job losses in manufacturing went in those, you know, in those large firms, large factories. That's, that was the experience, and many of you will remember the period of, uh, that we're talking about, when there were broadcasts every evening 
about 5,000 jobs in the North East, about 1,000 gone in South Wales, night after night after night. And what we see here is the impact of the crisis hugely concentrated in terms of sector and also geography, in terms of the North East, South Wales, uh, North West and so forth. 1990s recession is different. The impact is much less concentrated. Other, other sectors share in the job loss. The number of job losses in the service sector in the 1990s recession was double that in the, in the previous recession. So it's moving across, across the sectors and across industry. Job insecurity, and this is my point, grows in parts of the workforce that previously expected high levels of uh, 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 good employment prospects. So they have had high prospects and they were beginning to expose to it. Now, we're talking here about the current recession and first of all, to reinforce a point made earlier on, that the current recession in terms of uh, growth, GDP decline, is comparable with the 1930s. It is uh, it's lower than the recession of 1981 and 1991. It's significantly lower. So we're talking about 30s level of recession in terms of growth. What's really interesting and what we you know, need to address and recognize in terms of unemployment, it's very, very different. <coughs> in other words, if you look at here, this recession in terms of unemployment is much lower than the previous two recessions. So we're talking about a crisis of capitalism that's resulted in 8% employment and it's made that, maintained that significantly for, for a, a quite a few quarters as economists say. My point is this, that the impact of the recession, how, you know, how it was felt and experienced by the working class, is not confined to jobs. And it also happens in terms of wages, benefits, pensions, and so forth. Much, much broader in terms of you know, its impact. So if we look at the, the impact of this you know, structural change within the last 30 years, when it was very, very concentrated and condensed geographically and sexually, it is now generalizing across the working class, across the public sector, not just in jobs. The impact of that is to generalize, it is to establish the commonality of interests across occupations, across regions, across sectors. It generalizes massively. It reinforces the need to collectively resist, to defend that common interest. And the argument that somehow technological change or what have you has drive some kind of polarization within the class is not only wrong, it's going the opposite direction. Thanks. The argument about uh, a new capitalism, um, a change in the nature of work, transformation of society is predicated by this idea that there are new patterns of engagement between employers and workers, new patterns of engagement, that it is relational change. People like Sigmund Beaumont talk about an individualization within the, work, uh, within the workforce. Workers don't in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, engage with the world collectively, but do so on an individual basis, because the bonds of reciprocity between workers and employers have been rendered tenuous by globalization. The, so the argument is a bit, uh, fundamental to this, and that's why you know, people like Castells talk about the end of salaried employment, the end of salaried employment, the end of wage labor. It is utter nonsense. There's no evidence for it, and that's why I, kind of, I, mean, I, I, I invest a lot in trying to kind of establish the, the, the truth of these matters because trends are going in the opposite way. There's some good news and bad news in all this, with, I mean, particularly with the crisis. I believe, for instance, that we were not, this is a crisis of similar proportions in the growth uh, and GDP to the 30s. I do not believe we're going to go back to the levels of unemployment that we saw in Germany, in America, in Britain, and so forth, the 20 to 30 percent of, of, un, of unemployment. That's the good news. The bad news is something else. I believe that the ruling class has an agenda for fiscal consolidation and austerity, which is two decades long. Two decades long. We're talking about an OECD report last summer which says Greece is doing quite well with its fiscal consolidation. And if it keeps doing what it does, it'll get to 60% debt in 20 years' time. The fiscal pact for Italy says you can get down at 3% per year of your debt, of the government debt, from 120% debt down to 60% down to debt. That's what they're demanding. That's two decades. We're not talking about something that is an overnight swallowing a bitter pill. We're talking about a period now, a phase, 
and which, kind of, and which things are operating. Now, the idea of precariousness, and it's not a terminological uh, issue or kind of, uh, uh, there are important issues at stake here. Precarité, as uh, Bourdieu said, it was a mode of social control. People were made to feel insecure. If they have job insecurity, it is not a natural function of living in this world of fast technology, of changing of, of movements or, of, of global capital. People are made to feel insecure. Not only that, the left and trade unionists internalize that. Workers themselves in canteens and in, in workplaces say, oh, there's no jobs for life anymore. That's the, the discourse, it's real. To argue that the precariat occupies a place, a unique place, with a distinct set of insecurities, a distinct set of interests that sets them apart from the rest, I think is fundamentally mistaken and it goes against the what's happening. Now, again, it's not, it's not terminological because when Guy says, a third in the United States, a third of all employees, a third of all employees receive a significant share of income in shares. In other words, a third of employees in America are tied in immediately and directly to the profits of the companies that they work, they work for. And the precariat working around them have got different and antagonistic interests. So the, 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 the so-called workers who are hugely benefit, uh, benefiting from shares have a different set of interests from the precariat around them. Now, at risk of something like Victor Mildrew, I just don't believe it. <laughs> the idea that a third of the workforce in, in America receive big chunks of, them, of income through shares, I think, is, is yet to be substantiated. The idea of a distinct set of interests, a distinct set of insecurities. Johnny's point is really well made. The, the demands of young people, the youth with no future in Spain, what was it? Jobs, pensions, homes, these are, the, these are, the, these are the, uh, the issues and demands of the time. And that cuts with the grain of the working class movement, the broader working class. It's not separate from it, it's part and parcel of that. It's consistent with it, and so therefore the idea of some rupture, some bifurcation in the working class, some polarization of the working class, is, goes against the impact of the recession, which as I say, demands and reinforces the need to establish the commonality of interest and the collective need to defend them. Thank you very much. Thank you.